Hello and welcome to the Global Church Project. I'm Graham Hill. Joseph Naimatira's family was caught up in the Rwandan genocide. They helped targeted people cross the border into Congo and survive. After the genocide, he spent two years in a refugee camp where he lost his father, his first son, his sister and many friends to violence and disease. Joseph Naimatira's pain was taken to the cross of Jesus Christ where he found healing and hope and love and forgiveness. For the last two decades, Joseph Naimatira has helped others find forgiveness and peace and healing and reconciliation through Christ. His dream is to see the Rwandan tragedy redeemed as Rwanda becomes a model of successful conflict transformation. Joseph Naimatira, welcome to the Global Church Project. Mm, yes, thank you. Can you tell us something about your life growing up in Rwanda? Um, I grew up in uh, Rwanda in an environment where um, we didn't have much exposure because uh, Rwanda is a locked country with a lot of mountains. And I grew up in a big family and um, we yeah, just we, we went through school, education and uh, life was very tough. Everything was uh, very far or very hard. We had to work at a very young age to make the family go well and uh, the parents were kind of not wealthy uh, and not very poor. At one stage they also worked for a company in Congo and then they came back to Rwanda. So that's a bit about myself. What did some of your experiences growing up teach you about both ethnic prejudice and also faith in Jesus Christ? My family was not that uh, prejudiced because mm. uh, we didn't grow up hearing that we have to hate the Tutsi. I'm coming mm. from a Hutu mm. ethnic group. So that was not the case in my, my house. But uh, when I, I was a young man, just before marriage, when I went out of school, that was uh, the time when I started to get a lot of information about the past. Mm. So I was not very interested because in the home, that was not a conversation. So when some of the friends uh, started to talk about marriage. This is where it came very, very strongly. And they started talking very badly about the Tutsi. They talk about it, the Tutsi as arrogant, as people are very uh, proud and people want to be masters. So they were referring to the things that happened in the past. And uh, so, mm -hmm. and then they were immoral and all this kind of stuff. And so I picked quite a lot um, in, in talking with other young people you know, from the Hutu side. So during that time, because it was during the Hutu regime, I didn't have much opportunity to listen or to hear the Tutsi giving, you know, maybe a feedback or an opinion about what they were, uh, what was being said about them. So I just took it as a, as the truth, but I was not born again Christian then. So in 89, this is where I received Jesus. I came to church and what I was hearing there is that we have to love our neighbor. But uh, because it is just in the Bible, I could not connect what was being taught in the, in the Bible. And some of the verses like uh, in uh, Ephesians or Galatians, it's talking about no Greek or no Jew, but that was not connected to Tutsi and Hutu. I could mm -hmm. really understand the principle in the Bible, but I didn't really connect that. And that was also the life of the church, because even with some of the leaders, uh, I could hear the same prejudice against the Tutsi. And uh, some of the people saying, yeah, even if we are Christian together, we can't trust the Tutsi. These are liars. They are cunning. They are all that I was listening outside the church was also in the church. So I, I just continued with that. So I lived with both uh, being a Christian, loving God, having Tutsi. Uh, friends, brothers and sisters in, uh, in faith, in church, in Christian ministry together, but also on top of that, having the same prejudice. So mm. I continued with that kind of confusion until the genocide. There was a, there's been a lot of uh, discussion about the way in which Christianity was very large, a huge percentage of the population before the Hutu Tutsi war. What do you think was happening in Christianity at the time that either didn't stop the genocide or encouraged it? 
One of the things I see, um, even when we talk about Christianity being um, but large and in terms of numbers, mm -hmm. I think we need to go back to how Christianity came to Rwanda. Mm -hmm. I think at one point there was one king in the history who decided to turn Rwanda into a Christian country. It was mm -hmm. a commitment of a king and then he made a kind of commitment for the country. So all the chiefs during the monarchy time and uh, had to convert. It was like mm -hmm. a you know, a nation that is turning into Christianity. So it was not a matter of personal conversion. Even mm -hmm. when other churches came in, uh, like Protestant churches, Pentecostals, and all these other churches came in to teach about conversion mm -hmm. as a personal decision, mm -hmm. uh, still uh, they went to the other extreme. Now for the first one, I can talk about being nominal Christian. So that means you are a Christian because you were baptized, you had a Christian name, you could go to church and go through the sacraments. That was mm. the first part. But evangelical who came, the emphasis was more on heaven. Let's go to heaven. So we didn't really, on both sides, deal with the issues of identity. Who am I when I come in Christ? And so am I, do I cease to be this? And what do I do with uh, the other ethnic groups? How do we relate as brothers and sisters in the Lord? And even relate in the country? How do we overcome you know, these divisions, discrimination, ethnic hatred, how do you overcome? That was not part of the discipleship material or even in the preaching. So this is how the church became very weak. And then most of the people didn't know what to do uh, with the political you know, situation and the things that were happening, moving toward the genocide. And then some of the leaders were obviously taking side with uh, the leadership in, uh, yeah, in, in all that was happening. So the members were left to themselves. So mm -hmm. some took the machete and killed. Some didn't kill, but they supported. They just say, yeah, let's try it, uh, even if they didn't kill. Now for people like me, with uh, all the prejudices that were there, I was not part of the killing. We even took big risk in uh, hiding a Tutsi lady and she escaped. And, but I still, I was not really like, you know, um, pained or grieved seriously by what was happening in the country. So my prejudice almost like, um, was like, um, yeah, putting some kind of anesthesia in, in my heart. So I was not like, you know, stirred by what mm. was happening and condemned it mm. with all my heart. So I think the church was very weak because of all these aspects, no genuine conversion, no contextualized discipleship, no um, response no, to what was happening. There was no like leadership, no leadership into what is right. And also mm -hmm. uh, the prejudice that was um, yeah, with the leaders, some of them was, were also you know, in their talk, almost like encouraging. Uh, all the violence that was happening against the Tutsi. So it does raise questions about human identity and whether our, our identity is primarily in our ethnicity, our tribe, our nationality, or whether as Christians our identity is found somewhere else. Do you think that some of those issues have been raised in this whole uh, genocide? Uh, in Rwanda, we started mm -hmm. also to, when we talk about ethnicity, uh, as uh, our identity. Let me go back to uh, before the genocide. Ethnicity was written in our identity card. You were born yeah. and it was written. It was with you. It was everywhere. So when you became a Christian, you still moved with your identity card. Mm. You still, that was very obvious. And people didn't want to take a time to discuss and say, what does it mean to live with these two identity? Now the genocide happened. And after the genocide, the new government decided to do away with uh, ethnicity in the identity card. Even in the talk, it's not allowed in my country mm -hmm. to just, you know, come and present yourself as a Hutu or a Tutsi. That, uh, that is not, you know, encouraged by the law. So then Christians now are living with another kind of confusion, which is, what do I do with my ethnic identity? And uh, I've heard some people singing, like in church, saying, when we get to heaven, there won't be any Hutu or Tutsi. Or... So 
Now, I think it was time for us to start to think and go back to the Bible. And so when the Bible says, we are a holy nation, and um, so do we stop to be what we were? Uh, as Kutu uh, or Tutsi, if we say we are a new, a new nation. And uh, that is in First Peter um, chapter 2, verse 9. It's very clear that we are called to be part of a new family. But that family doesn't deny our uh, uh, identity, our natural identity. And the Bible talks in um, Revelation and about the glory of, uh, of the nations will be brought before the throne of the Lamb. So the glory of the nations, it's the glory of the uh, ethnic group, the glory of the tribes. I think there is, uh, maybe in other places, it is very obvious. When I'm working in Congo, we always encourage people to look at their culture because the tribes mm -hmm. are very evident and say, what is godly in our culture that we need to come with mm -hmm. in the bigger mm -hmm. family of mm -hmm. God? So we encourage that. Maybe in Rwanda it is a bit confusing because our cultures are not different. The Tutsi and Hutu, we have same culture, same language. But I think for places where identity is very distinct, we need to respect, we need to honor our ethnicity, our, our tribe, mm -hmm. our nationality. We need to honor these things as a gift mm -hmm. from God and then mm -hmm. use them for the glory of God. And this is what we see in Paul as a place where he's talking about being a Hebrew when it is glorifying God, he's presenting himself as a Hebrew, not to uh, dis distance himself from others, but for the glory of God. It's only when it is glorifying to God, we can stand in our natural identity. At one point he says, I am a Roman citizen, only when it is a time when he use it for the glory of God. So I think both identities are values. It depends on how we use them. If I am a Hutu, I publicly say I am a Hutu only when I want to repent about the sin of my people, about the genocide. So no one is offended by that, acknowledging that I'm a Hutu, but what am I doing with that? That is where the, the issue comes, comes in. We, we, I think in the Kingdom of God both are valid. Our new citizenship in the Holy Nation, the spiritual family of God is very valid and it should be the primary, the primary identity. So it should be first of all from that identity before now we, um, yeah, we talk about our natural identity. Maybe most of us uh, in Africa, when we talk about tribalism, we'll find like loyalties. Let me give an example of Kenya. When there was a war in 2008, Loyalty was first to the tribe, so people will first draw their identity, their, their, what do we do first, it was, instead of going to my church and say, my pastor, I am here, and uh, what do we do, the tribal conflicts, so what do I do, people could go first to the chiefs of the tribe, so that is loyalties, um, this is where the problem is. It's not wrong to be a Kikuyu or Kalenjin or Luo. The problem is where my loyalties go. Uh, and, and this is what shows where my primary identity, mm. source of identity is. It's first of all in God, in the family of God, but also I can't throw away my natural identity. It's a gift from God that I, I should use for His glory. And how did you experience God's faithfulness and promise in a refugee camp? You know, to leave everything you have worked for, we had um, a small house and we had all these things that we have uh, uh, not, I can say, accumulated, but mm. we, we had mm. properties. So when we left, it was in a night and we had to run away into Congo. It's not easy, first of all, to leave everything behind and go in a place where you don't even know where you're going. And we were, we were many hundred thousands of people just you know, rushing into Congo. Now, that was the beginning of a journey, uh, which is really, you know, it's, it, it's very hard to explain, but uh, we could now see the hand of God. I used to read the book of Exodus, but sometimes you could feel like this is a movie. You know, it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's right because it's in the Bible, 
But at one point you could think, how can people be in a desert and then God gives water and uh, manna and all these things? They were good, but a bit this, this, you know, it was in the distance. But in the refugee camp, we saw that it was God's protection. We were living in a plastic tent with people who are hungry. People, some of the militia were living among the people and they had power. So when we prayed and said, Lord, protect us, it was real. It was not because there was anything else. There was no police, no, no one for you. It was about God's protection. It was real. When we say God provide to our needs, our daily bread, that was real. I remember sometimes where we didn't have water for many days. And so as a small church, we used to come together, small churches in the camp, and pray for rain. And first two days, three days, until there was rain for the people in the camp. That we saw God really at work in the details of their life. And so I can see the Bible was real. We talk about Matthew 6, 33, it says, Seek the kingdom of God and the other things will be added. We saw that. And I think for me, the Bible became real. What was your journey to healing when I came back to Rwanda in 96, uh, I didn't come back because I wanted it, because the camps were mm. destroyed. And uh, in 96, this is where I attended my first workshop. It was uh, when Dr. Rhiannon Lloyd came to mm. my hometown in, in the north of Rwanda, and they were conducting a workshop for church leaders, and uh, I attended. And so I was confused. When I was back in Rwanda, I was living with shame, shame of being Hutu and uh, uh, an ethnic group that committed the genocide. So my identity was was mixed with the genocide. It was like I didn't kill anyone, but I am one of them. I'm one of these people. I didn't know what to do with that. And so in my heart, there was fear and there was uh, anger, bitterness, because when I went to the camp, I lost my father, my sister, and my first son. So all the pain and grief and was also there. And that made me to become very resentful against the Tutsi. Mm-hmm. So then it was very difficult for me to live in Rwanda, knowing you know, it was a, a government, new government, after the Tutsi of, uh, you know, had victory on the nation. It was very shameful and it was, I was in, in a situation of uh, confusion, total confusion. Mm-hmm. And then in that workshop, there are some of the things that really helped me. One is when Rhiannon asked forgiveness on behalf of uh, the West, in the mm. involvement of the West in uh, the Rwanda history. Mm. Uh, that really helped me to start finding healing. Another thing is when we did this uh, cross workshop. This is where I took the pain of all the losses I, I went through. I took all the pain to the cross and that really brought relief into my heart. And the, Third shocking, shocking thing is there was a Tutsi on the facilitation team who stood in the gap when he heard all the suffering we went through in the camp. He stood and said, I was very insensitive. When I heard people were dying in the camp, I was very happy. But they want to ask your forgiveness. And that was something I could not expect. That also really helped me to find healing. Those are the things that mm. helped me to rise from the despair, anger, bitterness, and shame. And when did you feel called to ministry? Uh, just after that, I think the calling, when we talk about calling, it's something that maybe we don't realize. I think as a family, we are called to the ministry of reconciliation because my grandfather was a chief in, his, uh, in the village and uh, he was the kind of mediator, natural leader, and every conflict was... Um, coming to our grandfather, you know, and uh, my father was the same. So I think that calling is a family calling mm-hmm. of being mediators, people who reconcile. And uh, so in the spiritual term of it, uh, maybe this is where Dr. Yannon, after the workshop, she just told me and she called me and said, I want you to come and help us. But uh, I was very nervous. I said, no, I can't do this because I can't speak about reconciliation coming from the wrong side of the genocide. I'm a Hutu Mm -hmm. from the north. Mm -hmm. And so she just said, we feel God is saying, you you join us. And I said, no, 
and uh, she insisted that I come and interpret, just to interpret. I said, that is easier. So I went with them and interpreted only once, and then she left. And so there was uh, me and another Tutsi with the responsibility to run with this very sensitive material. It was very delicate, because in 97, uh, the war was still on in the north. And so then I just felt, since I experienced you know, much, much healing, it gave me hope that what happened to me, it can also happen mm -hmm. to many. So it came gradually when I looked at the material and I thought, let me try this maybe for a short time mm -hmm. and then I will go back to life, to normal life. So in 97, I just started, first was translation, only one time and the rest of the time I found myself in this ministry and then I started to enjoy it with so much pain, difficulties, but I'm still there. What sort of things do you do in those healing, forgiveness, reconciliation workshops? We bring the pastors, and mm. first it was pastors mainly, but also mm. now women leaders, youth leaders mm. in the Christian community, in a village. We bring them together for a three days workshop. And so what we do is mm. to take them through a process where they look at some of the, uh, yeah, the what we call the pillars of healing. We, there are some of the topics that they go through. The first day, they look at, uh, at God's plan, understand a bit God's heart in time of suffering, and because many people after the genocide were angry at God. Some of them were saying God is dead or God has run away. And so we look at what is God in time of suffering. And so there are some topics where we look at uh, uh, the unity and diversity as God's plan. We look at the role of the church in uh, country in conflict, we look at uh, uh, what is the concept of the holy nation, suffering and the God of love. These are some of the topics on the first day. And then the next day, we focus on healing, losses, pain, trauma. And then we look at the cross as a place of healing. And we do a cross workshop. Actually, it's an exercise where people come together, sit, talk about their pain together, take them to the cross, pray for one another for healing. And the last day, we talk more about uh, forgiveness, repentance, and we end in what we call a celebration of unity, where we have a kind of feast and people uh, celebrate the, the restored relationship. But at some time after that, we come back to train some of them. Now, they, most of them have formed teams, and some of them became even organizations, or some of them are working under their own churches, and they, can, they are allowed to repackage the message into many formats. It can be art, drama, songs, or sports, events. Whatever they want to do, we support that in order to promote healing and reconciliation in their own community. Sometimes we have also worked with uh, NGOs, associations, and sometimes with local government leaders in taking this message to them. And uh, mm -hmm. so... And then after that, we have been invited to other places to do the same. How has God called you to help other nations benefit from the Rwandan tragedy? First was uh, in uh, Burundi. Yeah. Uh, it started with in 98, where uh, Burundi was going through a crisis. And uh, some of the people heard, because our situation yeah. is a bit similar, and they heard about what was doing, uh, we were doing in, in Rwanda. I was working for an organization. And so one of the people in, in Burundi heard about what we were doing. And they invited me and the team in Burundi. And we conducted our first workshop there. And later we developed teams in that place. And the second one was in Congo, South Kivu. They also invited us. And uh, we went and now we have developed teams in South Kivu. And it, it was mainly through invitation. And the, thir the third one was in, uh, in Kenya after 2008, after they have gone through um, violence, they also invited us. And uh, Dr. Rianan has also been invited in South Africa and uh, in another part of Congo. Later, I was also invited in uh, Ivory Coast. So in all these places, next week, we have been invited again in South Sudan. So it's mainly through other people hearing what we are doing and inviting us. Mm. What do you think are some of the features of successful conflict transformation? 
The first of all is uh, some of it is is not only the church; it's also the political will. And we look at uh, South Sudan; uh, they got in independence, and just after that, there is conflict. I think some of the one one part of it is mainly political. It's when the, those in in political governance decide we want to go the way of peace. That is a very big foundation because, like in Rwanda. It was first the country, the leadership, the government deciding, let's move uh, toward peace. And so that is a very good framework. And the second one is now peace. Those who are involved in uh, NGOs and churches deciding to use that opportunity now to, 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 to take the message of peace to uh, not only to the churches, and, but also to the community. And sometimes, when the churches come together and discuss about that, and they decide to do something, then the third uh, one is now finding the right tools. It can be what approach do we use? Not only one, what are the approaches? And then they can find resources from other places, and mainly looking at other contexts where they have been conflict that is a bit similar to them, and then resource um, from all these places. And I think those are the main mm. things. What role do you think that re, um, repentance plays in reconciliation? Not only individual repentance, but also corporate repentance. For Rwanda, it has been very, very important mm. for prisoners, people who have um, killed, to find the message of, uh, first of all, to help them deal with the guilt and the trauma of killing, because it is very heavy. but. We will also encourage them to go and ask for forgiveness because mm. some of them have been released mm. after some years in prison. They have been released back in the community and then they could not function because there are people who have been seen killing machete, you know, killing children and all this. So they could not function properly. Mm. So going to the victim to ask for forgiveness has been very healing also for mm. them. And then those who have been integrated in the community are the people who really mm. repented genuinely. And this is you know, how you find some of them have even formed associations. It's through repentance mm. and forgiveness. So repentance is very mm. key, not only for the people who committed crimes, but also mm. for those who have been hurt, who are looking for some genuine uh, apology. So that is uh, one aspect. And, but. In the case of Rwanda also, those who prevented, they could also tell what really happened. It also helped in the process of healing what happened. And they also helped find the bodies, where they threw the bodies for a decent period. That has been a very helpful um, process because of their contribution helped in the process of healing. But the other part is the corporate dependence. Mm. For me, coming from Congo into Rwanda, I didn't know what to do with what we call a corporate guilt. Mm. And most of the Hutu, they have that. Or oh, people who have been in a conflict, mm. maybe they are coming from the side of what we call the offender. You are not the one who did it. Maybe it is your political party. Maybe it is uh, your race or your uh, mm. tribe. And so when you become from such a group, you feel the weight of responsibility of what happened. You can't run away. You can't just say, it's not me. Uh, and so that is why it is very, very important. In case of mass killings, like in some places where a civil war, now people don't even think about individuals because most of the crimes are committed in the name of a political party, in the name of, uh, of a tribe. It's not only one-to-one. -one. So in that case, if you're coming from that group, it's very important to take responsibility and ask for forgiveness. I've done it, and uh, most of the victims have been very, very blessed by my repentance. Mm. I heard many saying, we, are, we didn't even know who killed our families, but we knew it was Hutu. That's, that's uh, mm. the only thing we knew. But you taking this on yourself and asking for forgiveness, that has been very very helpful and some of the people have even forgiven those who did it 
even if they don't know them. And then some of them later discovered the people who ridiculed. And then because their heart was prepared to forgive, they, it was easier, not easy, easier for them to forgive even the real people who did it. I think it's very important for one to take responsibility for the sin of the group and then become a, someone who builds the bridges between the offender, uh, the, the offender group and the victim group. How helpful has it been that Rhiannon has been taken the initiative to ask for forgiveness on behalf of what Western nations did in Africa as well? Uh, how often? It's, uh, it's every time we had a, mm. a, a workshop. I think we need to understand that there is a spiritual component to the asking for forgiveness on behalf of the, of the group, mm. but there is also a social, uh, a social component mm. to that. And so for any new group, sometimes those leaders, government or church leaders or the school, you know, like uh, students, university students. So every time we were in a group that is new, she asked for forgiveness. And we saw the response, especially in younger people, there's so much resentment against the West. And so that was more like on the social part to bring, it's like to help the people she meets for the first time, also to hear that repentance and uh, to be able to forgive. How do we get better at blessing and honouring different ethnic groups? That is, uh, one, uh, remember, when we, we do uh, there's a celebration, we, we call it celebration of, of unity. Now, in that last part of the workshop we, we, con we conduct, there is a uh, place where we do, uh, we give to people an opportunity to say, what is the good things that you see in the other tribe, other ethnic group, other race? And for most of the people, it will be the first time they can say anything positive about the, the other group. And it has been very powerful for the people, you know, who hear other tribes talking positively about them. I remember once I was invited in South Sudan, and uh, the, the, the Dinka tribe, which is the majority, now most of the tribes hate them very, very deeply. And so when we did that, first we talk about prejudice the first day. So when we talk about prejudice, people will feel, you know, the column of what they think negatively about the other uh, tribe. And it will be like a list of, 20 things, they are thieves, they are killers, they are cruel, they are immoral, they are sorcerers. And it's, it's too, it is there. This is what people live with in, in, in those beliefs. So in order to cancel and to revert uh, the, the, the curse of, you know, this uh, negative pronouncement, now we have also to, this is why we talk about uh, blessing the other community. Now what we do in two sets, one is to say, what is a good thing? I remember in South Sudan, when other tribes were speaking about the Dinka, they could not believe it, that people can think one, one positive thing about them. When they talk about their courage and uh, the way they could defend the other tribes, even in some places. And so it was very uplifting for them because they know people hate them. And it was the first time for them to hear people saying, you have some very good things. And that's one part. And the second part is we say, what do you want to see in the tribe? Uh, like, you know, what, how do you want God to bless them? So people talk about, um, you know, they are very, maybe it's a tribe that is very poor uh, or sickly. They are very sick. Mm -hmm. they, and so to bless them, we want God to do this for them, give them opportunity for education. We want God to prosper them in this way, to give them a spirit of uh, uh, courage and hard work. These are the things that are not there that we want to see God doing in that community. Because most of the time, people don't pray about the other tribe. It's like, you know, if they die and finish, that better. Mm -hmm. But this time, it's a kind of prayer. But we, we say it to them and say, may God give you this. May God prosper you in this way. And we have seen... Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, joy and and people going back really like uh, 
you know, with so much hope for, for mm. their community or tribe. So is it about discovering a new unity by celebrating the richness of diversity mm. that's gathered around God's, you know, banquet table? Yeah. And uh, so it's not a unity because we're all the same, but it's a unity in, in our rich diversity as created by God. Yes, we, when we have done it, we mm. also include an element to say, let's give to uh, each tribe an opportunity to present something extremely cultural that is yeah. particular to them. And some of them will present a song, some of them will do a dance, some of them will, and then all the others will join into that. Because there is so much mockery. They, their thing is rubbish. I was, you know, that is man. It's, it's about selfishness. But then when people join into whatever mm. uh, cultural, which is appropriate, that has been presented, it's one way of saying your culture is mm. valid. Your uh, language is, is, you know, is valid. It's to validate. Mm. That has been very helpful in uh, promoting Mm. unity in diversity. Mm. Is there anything else you want to say to us today? I am here in uh, this conference with MICA Network. I think my contribution to this was to help the church realize the message of healing and reconciliation is the message of the church. It's not the program for NGOs. It's the message of the church because reconciliation is the main theme of the Bible. So it could not, we can't just take it as a one of the angel thing, but as a church, wherever we are, it's very important to look back in our history and say, what are the things that have hurt people? Maybe there have been a conflict, even if it is a long time ago, or maybe some conflict is coming up. It's very important for the church, mainly in some of the, when things are very difficult, it's not only the local church, but churches to come together and sit and say, what do we do? There has been conflict. There has been major killings. There have been injustices, oppression in the past. Maybe it is happening now. So what do we do as a church? We are the people who God entrusted with the message of healing. Not only the responsibility, this is in Second uh, Corinthians 5, uh, 17 up to 19, we have the ministry, the responsibility of healing and reconciliation, but also a message. So for the church, it's not additional uh, to what they're supposed to do. It's not NGO responsibility. It's not government. It's primarily the responsibility of the church, local church in their own context, but also denominations or the body of churches in a country. It's very important to look at the history and what happened or what is happening and say if there is anything to heal or to there's a big task is to reconcile it's our responsibility thank you for joining us at the global church project mm, thank you the global church project is located at www.theglobalchurchproject.com on our website you'll find a wide range of interviews and resources for colleges universities and churches I look forward to your company next time. From me, goodbye.